Hello, I'm John Foster, and I'm a medical doctor who does Social Security disability exams. And today I'm going to be talking about muscular weakness, functional versus physical. As usual, everything I say represents my own opinions based on my own experience and learning and does not represent the opinions of the Social Security Administration or any other medical body. So why is weakness important? Well, the top three functional problems that I see on disability exams are functional range of motion issues, exaggerated or feigned tenderness, also known as overreaction, and exaggerated or feigned weakness. It's not always simple to differentiate organic from functional weakness, so I'm going to first to discuss functional weakness and then go over some clues that weakness is organic. The most common type of functional weakness that I see is called giving way or clasp knife weakness. In organic weakness, the weakness remains constant. For example, if I have the patient hold their arm up and then try to press against me, a weak patient will gradually be pushed back while exerting the same amount of force. It resembles bending a paper clip. Here I have a paper clip. I can bend it straight. I can bend it crooked. It, I need to exert a constant amount of force to overcome the resistance of the paper clip. In giving way or clasp knife weakness, there is initially a fairly strong resistance followed by sudden giving way, and this can alternate force giving way, force giving way, force giving way. It's as if the patient at first subconsciously resists the physician's pressure, then realizes, oh no, that limb is supposed to be weak, so they give way. But it's hard to maintain a constant force. Now, clasp knives are becoming relatively rare because most pocket knives these days are locking knives, but I have one here. It's a good old-fashioned Swiss army knife, and here it is. Now, the blade is out. When I want to push the blade back in, I have to press and press and press pretty hard, and then suddenly it gives way. That's the meaning of clasp knife weakness. Firm pressure followed by sudden giving way. There are no physical conditions causing muscular weakness that provide this sort of pressure giving way, pressure giving way, pressure giving way, resistance to pressure by the physician. So, using my arm to demonstrate, if the physician was pressing against my arm, in organic weakness, my arm would gradually go back. In clasp knife weakness, it would press, give way, press, give way, press, give way, press, give way. Not exactly as dramatic as that. It's more something that you can feel than you can see. I pay a lot of attention to the patient when they walk down the hall and come into the examination room and sit down. And here, again, are clues to weakness. The person who walks in normally sits down normally and with females puts their purse on the ground has demonstrated that they have at least four out of five strength in both legs and at least one arm. Walking is actually a system of controlled falling. 
we lean forward until our center of gravity is off balance, then we swing one of our legs forward to catch us. So the leg that swings forward has to be able to support at least half the body weight. In a 70 kilogram person, that's at least 15 kilograms or about 50 pounds of pressure. 50 pounds is a lot. Unless you're very muscular or a weightlifter, you probably cannot op oppose 50 pounds of pressure with one of your arms. So if during strength testing of the legs, the patient exerts a tiny amount of force, like a feather's being pressed against your hand, but they walked in and sat down normally, something's wrong. That brings me to my next technique of differentiating physical from functional weakness. When I would have the patient resist me, I used to press my hand against their extremity and then have them press against me. But I no longer do that. I hold my hand an inch or two away and then ask them to press hard against me. If the patient doesn't even move their extremity to touch my hand, but I've previously seen them walk or lift and carry things such as their purse, I know that I'm not seeing their true strength. It's functional weakness. Now, here's a pitfall to be careful of. Patients who have pain in an, ex in an extremity may not exert the force that they're capable of because it's too painful. So for example, if a patient has a bad elbow and you're testing arm strength, they may limit the amount of pressure they apply because it hurts their elbow to do so. So what are clues that the patient does have organic or physical weakness? Well, the first is muscle atrophy. The second is abnormal muscle tone, either spasticity in the case of an upper motor neuron lesion or flaccidity in the case of a lower motor neuron lesion. Next are abnormal or asymmetrical reflexes, hyperreflexia, overactive reflexes in the case of spasticity, and hyporeflexia, low or absent reflexes in the case of flaccidity or lower motor neuron lesions. Another pitfall is that sometimes patients can have both upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs. This can occur in multiple sclerosis and also in spinal stenosis. 20% of patients with lumbar stenosis, which causes lower motor neuron signs, will have a concomitant cervical stenosis, which causes upper motor neuron signs. Fasciculations indicate denervated muscle, lower motor neuron disease, and cannot be simulated by a patient. If a patient has weakness with fasciculations, they have organic disease. Finally, there are abnormal reflexes associated with spasticity. In the legs, these are the Babinski sign, which everyone knows and checks for. However, in the arms, Hoffman's sign is the sign of spasticity. In fact, it's called the Babinski sign of the arms and I think should be checked for more often. Again, a Babinski sign or a Hoffman sign indicate that the patient has organic disease. One last sign indicating organic disease, which is seldom mentioned, is Gower's sign. Gower's sign is described in children with muscular dystrophy but I've seen it quite a few times in adults during disability exams. Gower's sign is a difficulty in rising from a squatting position 
where the patient uses their arms to help rise and sort of looks like they're climbing up their thighs. When we rise from a squatting position, we use the extensor muscles of the knees and hips, the quadriceps muscles and the gluteal muscles. Those are proximal muscles and in conditions which cause proximal muscle weakness, such as diabetic myopathy or alcoholic myopathy, we may see Gower's sign. I've also seen Gower sign in people who are just deconditioned due to lack of exercise and inanition. Now I'm going to demonstrate Gower sign. So I'm going to squat down and then when I try to rise I'm too weak to get up. So I put my hands on my thighs and climb up my thighs. That's Gower's sign. Another functional sign that I see from time to time is uneconomic posturing. Normally, we use economy of motion. That means the minimum amount of motion and energy exertion to accomplish or the whatever we want to accomplish. For example, if I hold my clasp knife in one hand and I want to grasp it with the other, I move smoothly and grasp it. If I had a severe intention tremor, I would lose my economy of motion. In uneconomic posturing, the patient is trying to simulate a disability or disorder, but actually does something which is more difficult than what the physician asks. For example, I'm going to show the difference between walking with a true balance disorder and simulated balance disorder with uneconomic posturing. Now I'm going to demonstrate the gait of a patient with physical balance problems. So the gait will be broad based and the patient may hold their arms out and they'll take small hesitant steps, never lifting their feet high off the ground. Now I'm going to demonstrate uneconomic posturing of a patient with sim simulated or feigned balance problems. The patient may make dramatic movements as though they're losing their balance and at risk of falling at any time. But it's actually far more difficult to stand on one foot than it is to stand on two feet. Uneconomic posturing can occur in a multitude of fashions, but I most commonly see it during assessment of the stance and the gait. One more gait disturbance and then I'll wrap up, and that's the dragging leg gait. This is a sort of gait which some functional patients may demonstrate, but never occurs in physical disease. Here is the dragging leg gait. Always an indication of functional disease. Well, I hope you found this helpful. Keep in mind that by far the most common motor functional sign that I see is clasp knife or giving way type weakness. And always remember, if it happens, it's possible.